Order! 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 You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now to the paper front pages as ever. There's the Sunday Mirror. They say that a secret message, a social media message, triggered the Westminster attack. We'll be talking about that later on with Amber Rudd. There's the Sunday Express. I'm not the hero. He is. That's the words of the MP who tried to save him. You can see the blood on his forehead in that picture there. Um, the Sun has 82 seconds. That is the entire time this ghastly attack took to uh, play itself out. The Mail on Sunday is a story about Prince William's helicopter coming very close to being hit by a drone with potentially catastrophic uh, results. Sunday Telegraph has gone with UKIP civil war after Douglas Carswell, that was UKIP's only MP, has quit the party to be an independent. I have to say, UKIP civil war is many things, but news it is not. Um, the Observer then has that Mosul story you heard on the news there. We said dozens of deaths. They say 150 deaths. And inside the paper, they compare the coalition strike on Mosul with the way that the Russians acted over Aleppo, which is much criticised, of course, by us and Boris Johnson at the time. And then there's the Sunday Times has got a story about the EU uh, migrants going to keep their benefits. That's child benefits being sent back home um, after we leave the EU, it says that would break, it suggests, a party manifesto pledge and Boris Johnson attacking disgusting Google over terrorist connections in some of its sites. We'll talk about that as well. Sarah, let's start with uh, Khalid Massoud, the man who carried out this attack and what we know about him so far. Yes, well, the Sunday papers have had the opportunity to take a breath and delve into the background of what once used to be known, a man who used to be known as Adrian, and, uh, or even Aid. And he was a, a Jack the Lad figure at school, very popular in a band, uh, the, a sort of guitarist, the lead figure in that, very popular with the ladies, but always with this hint of violence and menace and very quickly drawn into petty crime. It's very interesting. When we talk about the kind of people who conduct acts of terror, um, and the Muslim connection, very often they're converts and very often they're people who've been involved in drugs, in drink and wild behaviour for a long time and they've been in prison as well. That's right and it was in prison in about 2003 that he was radicalised. A couple of years later he's on his way to Saudi Arabia and it's fascinating how fast mm. that process happened. But he spent before then a good 20 years or so drifting around uh, with different uh, women, always very attractive. That's his um, first partner and his lovely daughter. And, um, uh, but you can see he was brought up in very small communities and from the pictures you can see he was the mixed race kid in very white backgrounds. Uh, he spent a lot of time living outside Rye in East Sussex. He this wasn't is exactly not... brought up in one of those inner city Islamic communities that we're told is the sort of hotbed of this problem. No, absolutely not. But that. if he was a lone wolf, you can see he was always a bit on the edge of things, a bit the outsider, sort of the, the class clown, popular, but with mm. his own yes. set of codes. And, and then not very if honorable. he's radicalised, the question is, how is he radicalised? And that brings us to social media. Uh, and Trevor Canov, you, you, you've got a, an interview there from the Sunday Times with Boris Johnson where he lets fly at Google, I think, in particular. Yes, Boris gets very cross in this interview and says that I'm furious about it. He said it's disgusting. They need to stop just making money out of prurient, violent material. And this is the case, and they know perfectly well that they are harbouring and sheltering people who didn't mean to do us considerable harm. And it's not just terrorism. It's uh, drugs and it's uh, child porn. It's porn generally. Lot, lots of pretty filthy stuff. Yes, and uh, um, you know, they, they're too, too big to be challenged, but if the American courts are able to fine our oil companies billions of pounds for oil spillages which don't actually kill anyone, surely we can do something on that level against someone like Google. There is a real question of political will, Helena Kennedy. You've got Amber Rudd, who's going to be discussing this later on on the programme. Yes. She's writing in the Sunday Telegraph. She, she has a, a piece here on social media firms and that they've got to join the war on terror. And it just seems to me, I mean, you know, as a lawyer, that uh, we actually do have law, which is about inciting uh, violence. And if you have, as you, I mean, there's a, there's a, a piece in the, in the mail, uh, uh, the, the Sunday really mail. The really disturbing um, 
Uh, yes, it's about it's about it's about this, it's a lesson in how to stab. It's a stab lesson, and uh, it's a, a tutorial. How, now, you, how you can kill somebody who is wearing an anti-stab vest, nonetheless, like this police officer and, was. And, and it really is and it's online. It, yes, it's it, online, and it's a tutorial in the whole business of stabbing. Now, if somebody were doing that, um, you know, in a in a in a classroom somewhere or in a in a youth centre, they'd be arrested for inciting violence. And so we actually do have tools at our disposal. Um, it's just that the media is always something that the, the, the politicians are worried about taking on. And, uh, and it was thought that the, you know, the market would make it all happen because advertisers were saying we're not going to advertise with Google if they're, they're yes. putting this stuff out. Poor old Google slips down to, I think, £500 billion to its share price. Yeah, it, must be, it, must, it, must, it must be hard, hard for them. But the, but the truth is that you actually do have to use your teeth if you're, yeah. if you're a, a Home Secretary on this kind of stuff and you have to be making the media firms know that, uh, that this kind of stuff uh, is not Do you not think there needs to be a change the law, Helena? I, I actually think you've probably got stuff at your disposal already. Um, you just have to be fierce about um, threatening to use it and indeed using it. You'd only need one prosecution and you'd soon have people um, being worried about it. Now, I don't like interfering with the media. I don't like the business of, 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 uh, of, of, of threatening prosecutions, should... except where it's necessary. And I do think that showing folk how to stab um, and, and, mm. and the like and how to actually perpetrate violence is crossing the line. And we've always held that, and, and, I mean, that tr difference. Trevor, you're en endlessly attacking people for interfering with the media but the question is is whatsapp a messaging service encrypted at both ends is that the media no and i don't i disagree with helena on this because it isn't the media this is the electronic media this is the the google giant yes they? you wouldn't get this in the printed media in the british press or the american press this is online but nowadays uh, you know there's so much um power in those big companies I agree, absolutely. it's shifted from i'm afraid your old-fashioned world to to this new world and even those um uh, uh, media outlets are now um, wielding such incredible influence that, that, that people don't want to take them on and, and you see that it's Me not just sorry. that they used to think they were super cool and that they'd look um, out very... of date if they intervened with media also, charts I mean the last government was very afraid of that it had Google in and out of Downing Street every Uber other day and, Uber lobbies, too. And, I th lobbies too. and I think we've finally woken up mm. to the damage mm. they can also be doing and I think this actually opens mm. the door to attacks on their tax situation too. Yes. I think this may be the beginning, the chink in their armour but which I is exposed by terrorism. But yes. can, we can we just go back to this business about the, 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 this man who perpetrated this violence? We are seeing a shift. I mean, I actually think it says that ISIL's uh, attempts to recruit and then train up people to make bombs and so on to orchestrate violence has actually run into, into the sand to some extent. And you're actually um, having, to, they're having to rely on um, sociopaths, people with serious sort of m problems who are on, on, who are outliers who then kind of are radicalized and it's very much on you know on their own they do it through the, in, the internet he went mm. off to Saudi Arabia he was it looks as though he was radicalized in prison and that is one well, of the places a very there's a big prison connection and, the, and it's often about mm. people who who feel no form on their lives and suddenly a very very limited uh, restrictive kind of Islam provides rules that are very are, are very clear and concrete so there is a very significant a single it. common denominator in all of this which happens after after they leave school usually in the interim between uh, leaving school and and becoming adults they get into the drug and drink world and this applies to all of the people involved in all of the mass uh, murders uh, the, the massacres in Nice and Brussels and, uh, and and this guy Masood was a heavy drug user and pumping himself up on steroids for bodybuilding yeah. and all of that Peter Hitchens I think in in the uh, Mail on Sunday yes he's named this up. yes he's, he makes the point that uh, there this is the point that people will not address. They are pushing for the legalization of soft drugs, but in, they're ignoring the evidence of the psychotic influences that are lifelong in some cases. And of course it happened with the terrorist who killed Joe Cox. I mean, you know, he, he also was, a, was an outlier, somebody who then was infected by, I think, rather poisonous uh, uh, media stuff around xenophobia. So we say internet stuff around with Well, no, but, 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 but it was, it was it, but there was a lot of stuff being said in, in the great debate around the referendum about foreigners, and he didn't like that Joe Cox was, was mm. speaking so compassionately about re refugees, which is why he went after her. I possibly link this to the referendum no. debate. Um, well, but, I'm afraid that some of the Nevertheless, sure right, right at the top of the programme, Sarah, I said that given that some of these people are individuals, I don't like the phrase lone wolf, it sort of glamorises them, mm -hmm. but they're individuals, and all they need is a hire car and a knife. We have to be realistic now about the ability of the security services, however much money they've got, to actually find everybody like this and a stop them. Absolutely, and also just how 
quickly they can do so much damage. As you pointed out, 82 seconds is all it took, all it, all it took to absolutely. inflict that level of carnage. Let's Terrifying. move on. Um, I think, Trevor, you've got the story about... Um, we were promised a year ago, more or less exactly, by David Cameron, an extra 1,500 armed police officers, but recruitment is not going well. No, indeed, we're running short of them, and uh, one of the surprises that comes out of the uh, examination of what happened the other day is that, in, far from having armed police on the gates of Westminster, the seat of democracy that we keep talking about, there were no armed police except, by pure coincidence, the two Michael uh, protection officers with Michael Absolutely. Fallon. And uh, they, they weren't even uh, on routine moving about the palace buildings. They, they weren't any, weren't any which is a shocking story. lack of security. Um, Helen, now let's move on to another story. We've, we've, we've talked a lot about the terror attack. Let's move on to the observers' coverage of the EU, the big, big pro-EU demonstration. There was a, there was a huge Somewhere demonstration. Somewhere between 50 and 100,000 people, depending on who you read. Um, well, the, the estimates are always below what was the reality, but um, um, it was, it was uh, I don't think so. Um, a defiant, it was a defiant anti-Brexit um, uh, um, uh, de demonstration, but I think it was really also saying um, there, there were 48% of the, of, the, of the people who voted, and, and we've got to remember that wasn't even the full uh, electorate, but um, who really wanted to remain in, mm. in, in, in Europe. And so the message from that is that the kind of uh, exit it, reflecting the fact that people voted in the majority to leave yes. has to be softer than what the, than the rhetoric up until now has been allowing for. And so I think that people were saying we want something different from what uh, is being talked about. And I but and Helen, I do hope uh, that as a as a Labour peer, isn't that an example of Labour's weakness that to actually oppose what the government is doing on Brexit, there has to be a big demonstration outside the gates of Parliament rather than effective opposition inside Parliament to stop it happening? I thought it was regrettable that, that, that we didn't take a much stronger position on the fact that actually, um, you know, this is going to be a, a hard Brexit is going to be very, very tough on ordinary folk, um, but not just ordinary folk, middle class people too, mm. that in fact you're going to see people did not vote to be impoverished. But the, and, that, that's uh, exactly that's, what David Davis is saying in the, in the Sun today and uh, I, I haven't always been a fan of David Davis but I think he's one of the surprise uh, success stories of this Brexit government. Uh, here's a man who's a trained SAS killer who used to be known famously for... DD of the SS they used to if call he, him. If he saw a back he would stab it but he's come out as a very uh, harmonious figure saying mm -hmm. exactly what you're saying that this, isn't going to need, this doesn't need to be a hard Brexit. This, he wants, in, in this yeah. column, he mm. makes it very plain that they want to do a deal which is good for everybody, both in Europe and in Britain. And, and if, the, if the Europeans want to play it hard, we'll end up with a hard Brexit. And, so you, I and think actually you can see some of that at work with this idea that there is actually going to be a deal mm. on EU migrants that are here already being allowed to keep their benefits. Though that, benefits. according to your newspaper, would break a Conservative election promise yes, again. Yes, I mean, this government does seem to have amnesia yeah. as far well, as it's it original... Well, it has been by some absurd promises. <laughs> Just promise before we goes, finally but... run out of yeah. time, um, the UKIP story, a um, well, well, certain amount it... of amusement about Douglas Carswell, he was this kind of unlikely figure in a sense in UKIP, had a long war with Nigel Farage all the way through. Now he's out, he's an independent. What does it actually yeah. mean? And it, what, the what endless it, war goes on. It, it, it means that they've all stabbed each other so many times now, there's literally not one person left standing. And it's, a, it's no coincidence because we're on the eve of this great bill and the great trigger and there's no point to UKIP anymore whatsoever. You summed they it up will, with your opening remarks. They, they will disagree, but we have a very, very big week ahead. Thank you all for now very much indeed. Very interesting. Let's take a look at the big stories on the front pages this morning. The Sunday Mirror says Khaled Massoud was given the order to carry out Wednesday's Westminster attack via social media. MP Tobias Elwood has said he's not a hero after trying to save the life of PC Keith Palmer. That's on the front page of the Sunday Express. The Observer reports that the Iraqi military has halted its operation in Mosul after an international backlash against civilian deaths. The Sunday Telegraph leads on the fallout in UKIP after Douglas Carswell quit the party yesterday. The Sunday Times says EU migrants in Britain will continue to be paid child benefit after Brexit. The Mail on Sunday says Prince William's air ambulance almost collided with a remote controlled drone, although the Prince was not on board at the time. And The Sun on Sunday reports on Cheryl's new baby boy. Well, to talk about all that and more, we're now joined by the author and journalist Harriet Sargent, the former extremist, now anti-radicalisation campaigner Hanif Kadir, and the editor of politics.co.uk, Ian Dunt. Thank you very much for 
being with us. Well, it feels like we should start on the appalling uh, attack in Westminster that happened uh, this week. We're starting to get a bit more information about what actually happened, the length of time that it took, um, whether or not he acted alone. There's quite a comprehensive write-through, really, in the Mail on Sunday, isn't there? Uh, was there anything that stood out to you, Hanif? Um, there's quite a few things, actually. Um, well, one of them is that you know, we know it doesn't take too long to carry out a terrorist attack, but today, I mean, in the, in the papers, it was mentioned 82 seconds. Mm -hmm. And it's remarkable how, when you put a figure to that, you know, and, and the, the time frame, that in such a short period of time, how a life can change or how things can change in, in the whole nation. And I think we need to be mindful that it's a challenge for not just communities or police or security service, but everybody to try to stop that short window of opportunity for people to carry out such an atro you know, atrocious attack. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's somebody who was effectively armed with a car and two knives. And yeah. yet, in that short space of time, he managed to kill four people. I mean, exactly. it seems almost extraordinary. It just takes it? nothing. And that's the, it sort of, Clegg was alluding to it a second ago. And you almost got it when we saw that front page of the Daily Mail earlier in the week saying, it took us just two minutes to learn how to use a car to kill people. Yeah. You yeah. sort of think, well, look, this is the thing that, yeah it is actually quite easy to cause this degree of chaos. And there are so many people out there who could potentially do it. That's why it's not always the answer when something goes wrong. Of course you take stock and you see what can we change, but you also need to be realistic about the idea that you cannot eradicate chaos from our lives altogether. And you will never eradicate people who are you know, either sick in the head or, or have twisted ideologies altogether. So there is a limit to what can be achieved in the wake of these things. Also, I think we can't just blame. I mean, there's now everyone saying, well, they should have done this or should have done that. But when you're making decisions like that in a second, should they, those gates have been left? Should he, the policeman have let people run in? How can you turn back and in, in a panic situation, with literally in seconds, making a decision? You can't go back and blame people for whatever decision they made. Of course, and I think no one would ever perhaps blame the people mm. in the situation at that time. But at the same time, are there questions that should be answered about the fact that this man wasn't armed uh, while he was guarding a place that we know mm. is a weak point at Westminster? Yeah. I, th I think it, it all boils down again. I mean, blaming or, you know, we can't stop every kind of, you know, uh, violent attack in, in, in the country. But what we can do, and I think, you know, we can, we can always go back and blame this should have happened, that should have happened, and it's always going to happen. If people were armed there, there'll be another way of doing it. You know, terrorists are very smart in carrying out their, you know, their acts. I think what it all boils down to is that, you know, it, this thing can be eradicated. And, it, and we, know, we need to invest more within communities, and communities have got a, a, bit, a, you know, a bit more of a role to play in tackling this problem, uh, especially communities that are excluded from mainstream engagement. You know, and it, and it, it falls down to there where we can you know, identify individuals like that, talk to them uh, and direct them uh, uh, you know, uh, on an alternative path. And I, I think if we look at extremism and the way it's evolving and we adapt ourselves and, and change our, so our methods of approach, we could potentially stop this from happening. It's interesting about coming in earlier, isn't it? Because this brings us to um, this other uh, story that we've been looking at, also in the mail, about radicalisation uh, and in particular radicalisation in prisons. I mean, yeah. how much of an issue is that, do, do we think, radicalisation in prisons? Um, well, I, I, th I think it's a huge issue and uh, it's moved from radicalisation in the mosques to the prisons. And the reason is very simple. I, I happen to know this because I, uh, during one of investigating one of my think tank reports, I befriended a gang of uh, a South London gang, and um, sadly, <laughs> despite my trying my best efforts, um, the, three of the four of them are in and out of prison the whole time. One is now in prison for for 15 years. The others are coming and going. And one of them, I have to say, none of them have been radicalised. But I've seen the the attraction, the seduction of becoming, as it's called, Prislam, you know, Muslim in prison. Um, not Muslim, Isla Islam, Islamists in prison. Um, and, uh, you know, one rang me from prison in great excitement because he said, you know, he, he'd been told that all his sins were going to be forgiven. And there was this chance to have a fresh start in his life and there was a chance for him to take back control of his life. And the, the Islamification was offering him that chance, and it was offering him the chance to, which he hasn't taken in any way, but to sort of have revenge on society that, that has put him in that position. And we have created, for various reasons, we have created a large number of, sort of vulnerable young, man, young men. This particular young man was in the care system, entirely neglected, as so many are in the, in the care system, who respond when somebody makes a fuss of them, which is what is happening here. 
We've been seeing, we've been talking about the prison crisis for years. I mean, not least since the cuts came in. I mean, once austerity started, we wiped out about 25% of the funding from the prison budget, and yet there was no shortage of demand. We kept on pushing more and more people into prisons. And if you have less prison officers and more and more prisoners, you cannot deliver care. And that goes just as much for radicalization as it does towards training people up and giving them yeah. some sort of role in society for work that keeps mm. them away from crime. What's your experience of this so, as well? I, Do you I, think that prisoners are particularly vulnerable as someone who, of course, has got experience? Of course they are. It, it goes without saying. I mean, going back to sort of 10, 12 years ago, when we were having this discussion, you know, with, with some specialists about prison reform and, and extremism within prison, and it was an unprecedented rate then, and that was 10 years ago. The, the problem here, and I've, I've been into prisons many times, to work with individuals um, and to sort of yeah, show them... Hasten a, to add. <laughs> absolutely. Um, to sort of, you know, to try to provide an intervention. Um, but there was, a, there was an organisation that was doing some really, really effective work, and because of political correctness, um, we decided, well, the government decided to move them away from providing that intervention. There's an individual that was running that organisation who works for NOMS, the National Offender Management Service. Um, didn't move him away from his job, but they stopped that organisation from doing effective work. And at the moment, extremism within prisons is it's on an unprecedented level. Mm -hmm. And you've got the most high-risk individuals, Anjum Chowdhury, you know, uh, no less, and all of his soldiers are operating within our prisons. Uh, and they've got their soldiers right across the country. That's quite it's, frightening. It's too. worrying, and we need to do something about well, that. Is, I, I have to say, I mean, they are starting because now, for instance, I mean, in Belmarsh, he, they are having a separate unit so that they can keep them away from these young, vulnerable, usually short-term prisoners. But, but I think that's not the solution. They, prisoners, um, or those that are vulnerable within the system, mm. need to be given an alternative network, an alternative yes. narrative. Yes. You know, because we can't just isolate certain people. Mm you're going to challenge the ideology. And that's one thing that we've been doing throughout our history in the last 10, 12 years, 20, you know, seven days a week, 365 days a week, challenging extremists within their environments. But unfortunately, it became too risky for the government for us to continue to do that. Let's um, end on something slightly different. Um, this Sunday Times story, which is basically saying that there's a campaign to try and get people to do more sport and maths at school. <laughs> now, this is my idea of my worst nightmare. I know that you've got some sympathy with me here. I do. This is one of the most hellish and evil proposals I've seen <laughs> for some time, that they want to combine the two worst things in school, which were sports <laughs> and mathematics. Yeah. Uh, apparently, the one helps with the other, but I just... I have to say, like, as I was looking at it, my eyes just glazed over and the full emotional effect was... Fine. Well, I have to say, I chose this story because it's something I feel passionately about and it links up with what we've been discussing, but yeah. this is where the problems begin. Because there's so many boys... I, I had to go around primary schools and uh, uh, look at why boys were, were failing in primary schools. And um, the thing that private schools have discovered that actually boys are like large dogs. They need lots of exercise if they're going to perform. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you were not the large dog category. <laughs> and, and it could be used as a de-radicalisation tool. If you don't change yeah. your yeah. ways, you're going to have to do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe, maybe that's the way to try and, <laughs> to try and bring it in. Um, thanks very much, the three of you, for Pleasure. your thoughts uh, on today's news story. I've been